title for this morning is He Still Speaks. Can you say that? He Still Speaks. And if you'd like to go ahead and turn in your word to Psalms uh, 23, you've probably never have heard of this, these scriptures before, but uh, today's a good day to learn something new. Psalms 23. <laughs> he Still Speaks. Matthew 4.4 4 is a scripture that we've heard many times. It is the, the verse that uh, Jesus speaks to Satan when he comes to tempt him. And we know if Jesus needs to speak something to Satan when he's tempted, we should probably follow in his steps and speak the same thing. And it says, man shall not live by bread alone. Yes, this earthly body, it needs bread, doesn't it? But man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And this scripture actually, uh, Jesus is actually quoting the Old Testament. He's actually, Jesus is quoting Moses in Deuteronomy um, 8, chapter 3. It says, and he humbled you. Uh, Moses is talking to the children of Israel, talking about God. God humbled you, and he lets you hunger. Wait a minute, pump the brakes. God let them be hungry? Okay, let's see what's happening here. And fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Can you say there was purpose in the wilderness? And we're talking about the, uh, the Israelites. They were enslaved for 400 years. Uh, God sends Moses to bring them out. He brings them into the wilderness because they're going somewhere. They're going to a promise that God gave to them. It was a land flowing with milk and honey where they would no longer be slaves, but that they would reign and that he would rule as their God. He's bringing them out. But, the, but what happens is... When they get to the wilderness, Jesus immediately is, uh, I mean, God uh, immediately sees that even though they have left Egypt, there is still some Egypt inside of them. I'm not going to fault them one bit because I would be the exact same way. For 400 years, they were led by a slave master. For 400 years, they did not make their own decisions, but followed orders. For 400 years, they had the same routine from sunup to sundown, work, work, work. For 400 years, the mentality was all about survival. God brings them out into the wilderness. He wanted a relationship with them. He did not want to replace Pharaoh. He did not want to be a slave master. So this is a mentality that the Lord had to break off of them in the wilderness. And so what he did is he brought them out and he allowed them to be hungry. Some people would say, wow, that's kind of cruel. You finally give them, you perform these miracles, you uh, going through the Red Sea, providing uh, 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 protection from uh, Pharaoh and the armies that are coming to destroy and kill them. They get to the other side, they're headed, they have hope again. We're going to the promise that we've heard about for 400 years. But pump the brakes, things have to, we have to take a pause here because there's some internal things that God needs to address. He knew they were not ready to possess. He knew they were not ready to reign and rule because they had still had a misunderstanding in their relationship with him. He did not want them to look at him as only providing for the natural. He wanted not only to be Jehovah Jireh, their provider, he wanted to be their father. He wanted to be their Lord, their God. He wanted to have a loving relationship. He wanted to provide food for them, yes, for their body, but he wanted to provide that spiritual manna for his soul, for their soul, for their spirit. Remember, we are part physical, we are part spiritual. Whatever you feed will be strong. Whatever you feed will rule and reign in your life. Are you feeding your flesh or are you feeding your spirit woman or are you fe feeding your spirit man? So we find 300 years later, the great, 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 
uh, grandchild, David, comes on the scene. So he has been raised in, uh, in a, a Christian home, we're going to say it like that, where God was the source, God was, uh, ha- had a healthy relationship with God, and he trusted God on like anyone we've heard of. Even the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. God trusted him so much that he handpicked him to be the king of his chosen people. So that is favor that David had. Um, Most Christians today, they make an art out of confession and repentance. They have, and I'm saying this with not being disrespectful, a immature relationship where everything is just about, uh, I'm a sinner saved by grace, And you will hear them say a lot, and I used to be there, well, God knows my heart. But you can recognize a mature Christian because what you're going to hear them say is, I know God's heart. You will hear them often say, God says The Bible says, when I was growing up, that's all I heard from my parents and my grandparents, and I don't know what happened in the church and with the body of Christ, but we kind of uh, taken a step back, and we feel like we have to kind of change the the, the presentation of the word of God, but I think it is time for us to get back to the Bible says, God says, and not out of obligation, but it is flowing from our hearts. It is of the overflow, and we're going to get into that in just a second. Um, don't get me wrong. We all have a starting point. The issue is if today, if 20 years ago you got saved and for 20 years you're still at the point of saying, well, it's okay, God knows my heart, that tells me that you're not uh, taking ownership for your walk with God and, and, and growing in your walk with God. And that's what we're going to talk about here a little bit this morning. David was fully committed to God. He knew God's words. He knew God's voice. Can you say he knew God's words? He knew God's voice. He knew God's heart. He was obedient to God because he knew the Father's heart towards him. It is easy to obey people we trust. Uh, Josh taught us years ago, whenever we were uh, youth pastors, that rules without relationship will cause rebellion. So if there's some rebellion in there, it's because the relationship is not as strong as it could be. That is in the natural, but it's also in the in the supernatural, in the spiritual realm. Rules without relationship will cause rebellion. But when you have a relationship with God, like David did, you fully trust him because he has been a faithful father and a faithful God. I think what we're going to do um, is go ahead and go old school. So I'm going to get everyone to stand up for the reading of God's word. So Psalms 23 The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Will you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the scripture. I thank you for the heart that David had for you. It is an excellent example for us to follow. Lord, this morning, will you give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, that we need to stop, we need to pause, we need to listen, because you still speak. Your words are life. Hmm. 
Your words are more than enough. Lord, I pray that you will give us a desire greater than ever before to get into your word, to have a closer relationship with you. I give you glory. I give you praise in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. amen. You may be seated. David had a heart after God because he had experienced the goodness of God. As you know that uh, David was a shepherd boy. Most of you know that he was a shepherd. So he knew all about taking care of the sheep. He knew uh, the ins and outs of providing the food, providing the water, providing a shelter, a safe place. He also knew how the shepherd protects the sheep at all times, that the shepherd would actually risk his life for the sheep. Because of this relationship he's had with God, he is expressing the love that the father has for him that in David's life, he has experienced God providing for him for the natural and for the spiritual to provide things for him to grow, to be healthy and strong, but also to protect him from the wolves, to protect him from the bear and the lions and uh, anything that would try to come to destroy him. Um, in John 10 and 4, in the chapter of John 10, uh, Jesus is also referring to his love for the sheep. But in these verses, Jesus actually declares that he is the good shepherd. And we know that Jesus used a lot of parables to talk to um, the generation of, at that time. That is earthly stories that have heavenly meanings. And so, of course, talking about uh, shepherds, that is something that a lot of them were connected to. So, so uh, John 10, 4 says, when the shepherd brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, he leads them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Can you say, know his voice? And then John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my sheep own or I'm known by my sheep. Notice it doesn't say uh, they hear my voice. It says they know my voice. They knew the difference between the, the voice of the good shepherd and of other shepherds because they were in constant contact. If you want to know the voice of your shepherd, you need to be in constant contact with him. Uh, whenever uh, of course, during that time, Jesus is there with them in person. It's different for us today. So I'm so thankful that he talked about knowing the voice, not just uh, hearing the voice. Because we are not face-to-face -face with Jesus. He doesn't walk with us in the flesh. So we actually have no clue what his natural voice sounds like. But we identify when he speaks by his words. Let me give you an example. And this was really hard because I wanted to give you some famous quotes of people, but because of technology over the last hundred years, there are videos or um, recordings of different voices. Like, I, of course, I wanted to say, who said I have a dream? Uh, we would all know who said that, but we've actually, most of us have heard it. So I, to prove my point, I uh, went back to find three quotes. So I'm gonna put you to the test. If you know the answer, I want you to yell it out. If you don't know the answer, yell it out anyway, and we'll laugh together, okay? <laughs> so, famous quotes. I cannot tell a lie. George Washington. I did cut it with my hatchet. <laughs> uh, the ones who have no clue are like, what is she talking about? Look it up. Look it up. Okay, the second one out of three. To be or not to be? That is the question. William Shakespeare. Okay, last one. Nothing is certain except for death and... Who said that? Ben... Ben... Benjamin Franklin. Okay, I don't think anyone was alive at... Oh, Pastor Roy, did you hear them say this in person? <laughs> And that also means Candy heard them in person. <laughs> but the truth is, we never heard them say that, right? We never heard their voice say that. But there is obviously 
recorded quotes in books or in historical documents that prove that they said these things. So whether you actually heard the words coming out of their mouth or whether you heard the quote, you know that these are their words. And that is how it is with Jesus. We do not know what his natural voice sounds like. So whenever he says, my sheep, you know, they, they know my voice, it's, remember, it's about the words that he is speaking. Whether Jesus spoke 2,000 years ago, whether God spoke 6,000 years ago, or whether the Holy Spirit is speaking today in your life, they are consistent. What they say is what they mean, and what they mean is what they say. There's no confusion. There's no inconsistencies. They say the same thing for all time. God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So whether you're reading scriptures that are 6,000 years ago from in Genesis or whether you're reading scriptures in Revelation of things that haven't even taken place yet, it is going to be consistent the whole way through because he does not want to confuse you. He doesn't want you to fail or stumble. He wants you to succeed. And he knows that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If he is saying that his words are as us eating physical food. We eat physical food three, four, five times a day, depending on who you are. How many times a day do you think we should be eating his, his spiritual manna, his spiritual food? I think it should be also daily as well. Once again, Jesus' blood is the only thing that saves us. So let's Get that straight. Only Jesus' blood, his sacrifice is what saves us. But it, having the word of God within you is what will de uh, determine whether you have a victorious life here on earth. It's not just, remember, about the blood of Jesus. It will get us to heaven. But whether you get there through rough terrain or smooth terrain, that is all dependent upon if you have the word of God within you. And... um. The Bible tells us, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing. See, those people that just answered that, that tells me you are in God's word, so good job. A renewing of your mind. And I actually looked up, what does renewing of our mind mean? Obviously, that was in the New Testament. Mark, I know you know Greek. Could you share with us what that means? A Greek definition is a renewed mind, a complete change for the better, a makeover of the mind and of the soul, doing away with unhealthy thought patterns and replacing them with true godly ones, also known as the mind of Christ. So when we renew our minds, we're doing away with the fleshly and the worldly thought processes and the patterns, and we're putting on the mind of Christ, the things that are true, the things that are yes and amen, uh, the things that will stand the test of time. We know that this earth and heaven will pass away, but what? His word will live forever. So how do I know if I am being renewed in my mind? I am so glad you asked. And yes, I stole that from Josh. <laughs> so how do I know if, I, if I'm being renewed in my mind? The Bible tells us in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance or the overflow off your heart, your mouth speaks. Now, this is not the only way. This is just one of the ways that I'm going to use as an illustration. How do I know if I'm being renewed in my mind? Um, does anyone know what this is? Um, you know it's a water bottle because it's clear. What do you think's inside there? If I took the lid off and I would put some pressure on the sides of this water bottle, what would happen? Water would come out of the top, right? Because what's inside, when pressure is applied, will come out. So, for an example, if this was a different type of water bottle that was not clear, I might be playing a little trick on you, and I might have something else in here, and you wouldn't know what was inside until I applied the pressure, and it came out, and then you would be able to, ah, oh, that's what it is. It is the same with you and your life. When life happens, when people happen, 
They can apply pressure to you. And when the pressure is applied, what's in your heart will automatically come out of your mouth. And that will be the evidence of the condition of your heart and the evidence of the condition of your relationship with God. You can say ouch and amen. I didn't say that to convict you. I said that because the Holy Spirit, he loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. He wants you to be just like him. He wants you to be just like him. The mind of Christ. So out of the abundance of the heart, when uh, it is applied, that's what the overflow takes place. I'm going to use Barb's mom for an example. Barb, can you wave? Love you. Her mom was one of the sweetest women you will ever meet in your life. And she was faithful coming to church here until she wasn't able to come to church anymore. But um, when she was first staying at her home, I would go and visit her occasionally there. And I'm going to say whenever I would go in, she was always, whether she knew you or not, she's going to be consistent. She's the same. She's the sweetest lady ever. And she would not always know who I was, even at the house when I would come to visit her. But I would say, you, you know me from church. Can Candy and Roy, oh yes, Candy and Roy. She would remember who Candy and Roy, because they make a wonderful lasting impression on people. I tell them all the time, they're the heartbeat of our church. They're the, besides Jesus, they're the cornerstone that holds it all together. <laughs> Setting the culture for our church of love and acceptance and family, because that's what we want Covenant to be, a place where you are not just someone that sits in a seat, but you are part of the family of God, the part of doing life together, and, and we owe a lot to um, Pastor Roy and Candy, Elder Candy, for all of that. But um, then there came a time, Barb, where she wasn't able to stay at home anymore, and they had to transition her, make the decision to transition her um, to, to the health, um, uh, I don't know what the proper terminology, but I'll just say to the, the home where she could get some extra attention and, and TLC, and so I would start to visit her there, and as the months or years would go by, she definitely was, did not remember who I was at all, and, but she was always so sweet. Uh, um, I would even, you know, ask her about Barb in the beginning, and then even kind of towards the end a little bit, it, uh, she may have even kind of sometimes forgot maybe even who her, her daughter was, which was hard for Barb, but this is the point. Life was squeezing her. It was probably more challenging on her family maybe at this point than it was for her. I would mention different ones from the church. I would miss, mention her family. She was sweet and kind. She's like, I just don't remember. But then I would say, let's talk about Jesus. Oh, yes, Jesus. She knew the scriptures. We would sing the songs. She would know the songs. That proved the condition of her heart, her spirit woman. For years, she had a, a strong relationship with God. She made a choice to get into God's word. She went to church regularly. She hung around with people that were going to encourage her to grow in her walk with God. And what was inside of her would come out when she was being squeezed. And that was just in a perfect example uh, to me, and I hope to all of us, the importance of having a strong relationship with God. We know that life is unfair. There's some bad things that happen uh, along life's journey, but God is good. He'll see us through those valleys and get us over the mountaintops, but you're going to make it a whole lot easier on yourself if you have a strong relationship with God and that you have the word of God within your heart. So that you can just stay. It's easier for a shepherd to lead a sheep whenever there's nothing between the sheep and the shepherd. But yet, if you have things in between, oh, what did he just say? I didn't hear that. Or the different distractions that might take place. But um, the Bible says also in Psalms 119.11, Your word have I hid in my heart that I shall not sin against you. Your word have I hid in my heart that I should not sin against you. So I, this is one of the scriptures that I learned whenever I was a little girl, and I have a little um, illustration for you, and I'm going to look for two volunteers to help me. Cheryl, thank you. Cheryl and Chris, come on up here. Put your hands together. Welcome, Cheryl and Chris. And can you bring one Bible? One Bible. One Bible. 
Cheryl, I love you. She's being squeezed right now. What is coming out of her mouth? <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> As you can tell, she is the introvert in the relationship. But um, my illustration is this. Cheryl is a woman saved by the grace of God. And because of that, here, Chris, you come back a little bit right behind her because she really, she is a woman saved by the grace of God. She is a woman that realizes all that God has done for her. She spends time with the Lord every day in his word. She spends time, uh, she is careful of, to what she takes in, so she listens to Christian music. I know she sings it. She has godly brothers and sisters because she wants to protect her circle. Uh, so that that um, Her brothers and sisters or her friends are always uplifting her, encouraging her in her walk with God, and um, she serves in ministries and there to help different ones. She is who she is because of he who is within her, and that is Jesus that is within her. Cheryl has hidden the word of God in her heart. So what that means is that she has a personal bodyguard. Chris, would you be a... I should have did this the other way around. I should have had you be the bodyguard. <laughs> so what is the, word, the, the bodyguard? Raise that up. The word of God. So what happens is because Cheryl has the word of God in her, the, the bodyguard is not going to allow her to sin. Amen. So you're going to come, and I'm going to pretend to be the enemy of Cheryl's soul. So you come right... I'm going to try my best to get to Cheryl. <laughs> Cheryl? So everything I'm speaking right now is what the enemy is saying, okay? Now remember, she's representing the heart of an individual that has the word of God in her. And that means she has her own personal bodyguard, but it's also her own personal spiritual woman guard because that's what he's protecting, the physical and the spiritual. So, Cheryl, everything I say is what the enemy is saying. This is not what I'm saying. <laughs> I would never say anything mean to you. <laughs> okay, so let me think. Hey, Cheryl. Those people in the back over there are like, what is she wearing? What do you think you're doing, Cheryl? Why would you even let Sarah use you as an example of a godly woman? Okay, you know what, Cheryl? I know you've been praying for your son. Guess what? It's not going to happen. He is not going to come back to God. He's going to be a prodigal forever. Why are you wasting your time praying? Why are, you, why are you wasting your time trying to sow seeds into him, Cheryl? You're wasting your time. Cheryl, I know what you did last week. Who do you think you are? I saw you raising your hands, worshiping God. I know what you did. The word of God is our protector. Not only did he, the word of God, it stopped the enemy's lies from planting seeds into Cheryl's heart that would grow and that would distract her from the truth of God's word. The opposite is because she has the word of God and you can stand to, I love that you want to keep, protect, keep protecting her. But isn't that what he does? He's a liar. In John 10, in that chapter, he actually says he comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. And he's talking about you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to take all that is good from you. And if you don't realize that you are at war, you're probably losing the battle. But the truth is, there is nothing within yourself that you can do to fight against the enemy except surrender fully to God. You may be seated, <laughs> but to fully surrender to God and to get the word of God because the word of God is a weapon. The word of God is a weapon. It's a sword that will fight against the enemy and all of his lies.
Every time the enemy comes to try to distract, every time he comes to tempt, every time he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, he will fail if you have the word of God within you. Because God said so. (laughs) Dalton, I'm going to get you to go ahead and make your way up here or however way you want to do it. It's not about knowing the voice of God, but it's about knowing the words of God, the Holy Scriptures. If you know the words of God, whenever you go to sin, he'll say, pump the brakes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not what you should do. He corrects you. He realigns you. He sets you back on the right path. Because he's a loving father, don't be be offended whenever he says, "Uh uh-oh, you need a recalculation. It's because he loves you. So don't be offended. Be thankful that he doesn't throw the clay away. Be thankful he doesn't throw his hands up and says, oh, not again. Come on. Get it together. No, he says, come to me. I'll put it together. Bring your mess. Come unto me, all that are weak and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. He wants to be your champion, your champion in your story of life. He wants to be your rescuer. He wants to be your provider, your protector. Now I'm going to make it personal for me. As you know, most of you know, our oldest son, Justice, he has epilepsy. And for this past year, it has been the best year that he has had in 11 years. Like, it's been like a whole year since he had even been in the hospital. He still does have daily seizures, um, but they are not not so bad. (laughs) I'll put it that way, because we have had years of bad. (laughs) Um, But on Wednesday, when we were out and about going to get his hair cut, Um, he started having some seizures. Most of his seizures, his daily seizures, happen whenever he's sleeping. So when he he starts having them whenever he's awake, then I'm alerted, and I'm like, okay, this isn't normal. So what else, you know, I need to pay attention to what's going on here. So he had a few seizures in the afternoon. He didn't get hurt or anything. Um, But then, and we came to church when I got home, he started having back-to-back seizures. And these were not his regular seizures. These are the seizures where he's not breathing. And for most of you, you're probably thinking, well, go straight to the hospital. Well, because of our years of experience, there's, we know there's not much they can do for him because he's already maxed out on medication. It's more of whenever he's having seizures and he can't breathe, we go so um, to help with oxygen and protect his heart and all that. So what's happening is for the first little bit, Um, Of course, he's laying in his bed, and I'm there with him. And what do I begin to do immediately? I begin to pray, and I begin to pray the Word of God. Because the Word of God is alive and active and powerful. I am limited on what I can do for him, but he is not limited on what he can do for my son. So I'm speaking this. That's how we fight our battles, with the Word of God. And uh, that is our weapon. So I'm pleading the blood of Jesus. I am reminding God of his word. You sent your word and you healed our diseases. You healed our sickness. And for the first 10, 15 minutes, you know, that's what I'm doing. And then when after, I'm going to say about a half an hour, then I'm starting to be like, um, I didn't really pray as much after that because I'm just trusting God heard my word, uh, my prayers to him. And then I'm just there as a support for justice, holding his hand, reminding him to breathe. Just breathe, babe. Just breathe. You're okay. Mama's here. I love you. Jesus is with you. And then he comes out of it. Okay, let's breathe. Let's breathe. (laughs) Let's breathe. Then he goes back into it. And we go through the whole thing again. And then after about a half an hour or so, 
then I'm like, okay, this is not normal. We got to go to the emergency room. Hopefully after the next one or two, I'm letting Josh know, go get my bags together, go get this together in between the seizures. So then um, we can get from his bedroom, hopefully to the car without a seizure. But then he started having a really long one. <laughs> and I immediately started uh, facing reality. It is reality. And everything that I was saying to justice, the Lord started speaking to me. He, as I was holding justice's hand, the Lord was holding my hand. Just breathe. I'm here. I got you. I love you. Just breathe. I got you. I love you. Just breathe. In those moments, the words of God was my lifeline. The words of God was a place of peace and hope and refuge. Reality was still happening, but because the words of God were within me, I was not shaken and I was not moved. We still had to go through the valley, but God was faithful and he was there. I was never alone. And even though I was limited in what I could do for my son, the son Jesus Christ was not limited at all. And even though we've been believing for 20, it'll be 23 years in a couple of weeks for his healing, and it hasn't happened yet, we are one day closer. And my faith is just as strong as it was the first day that he has had a seizure in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, when he was three years old. My faith is just as strong because God has proven himself to me over and over again. And I believe in the words that David had spoke. He is my shepherd and he will never leave me. He will never forsake me. But I have that hope because the word of God is within me. Jeremiah 15, 16, this is the closing scripture. Your words were found and I ate them. Your words became to me joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name. When you have the word of God within you, you know who you are, you're his daughter. And all that he has, he gives to you. You are his son, he gives to you. He still speaks. He still speaks. He wants to speak to you, not because of your goodness. He doesn't speak to you because of your righteousness. He speaks to you because you're available and your ear is turned towards him so that he can speak to you. The word of God is a place of safety, a place I am forgiven a place of rest, a place I am healed, a place of hope, a place where I am restored, a place that I am revived and given new life, a place where I am equipped to live a victorious life. He's speaking to you. Maybe you are a lost sheep but you feel a drawing in the spirit today and you have a realization that you need the shepherd as your savior. It's so simple. He said, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus, save me. Jesus, rescue me. And he comes running. It's that simple. For others in here, you may feel the drawing of the Spirit that it is time to go to the next level with your walk with God. It's time to make it a priority to get into the Word of God, to feed your spirit, to feed your soul. And remember, it's not just about your victory, but it's about the victory of your children and your family. Your victory life, your relationship with God is the gateway for your children and your descendants. Dalton's going to lead us in a song, Word of God Speak. 
And we're going to go ahead and have everyone stand. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, this is the time to call out to Him. For the rest of you, just take this time to hear what the Lord is saying to you this morning.